So last week we started a new series that we are calling Be the Church, Build the Church. And we brought to you a parable taught by, taught by Jesus in, in Matthew 25. And we talked about how when we are here in this vapor of a life, as short as it is, there is a gift that God gives all of us. God has given you and he has given me time, talent, and treasures. You might ask yourself, why would God have given you these gifts while you are here on this earth? The question we have to ask ourselves is what are we supposed to do with the time, talent, and treasures that he has given us? You know, the phrase that we should all long to hear that will one day be spoken by God before his throne is well done, my good and faithful servant. What does a servant do? Serves. A servant serves. If you are sealed in Christ, if you have said yes to life change, if you have accepted Jesus to be your personal savior, you have sealed yourself as a servant of righteousness, a servant of Christ, a servant of the most high God. Serving God is all about stewardship. It's all about serving him and serving his kingdom. You think about stewardship in the form of legacy. We use that word a lot, legacy. We want to leave a legacy behind us, but you see, we have it all backwards. This life is limited, is it not? Yeah. One day we will be leaving this earth, I believe sooner than later, and we will be joined together with Jesus. We will be with Christ. We will be in heaven, our home. And that truly is when life will begin. But while we are here, we've clocked in. We're at work. We're employed by God to do his work, to do the good works that he had called us to do many years ago, long before we were ever even born, Ephesians 2 and 10 says. So we are on assignment. And as your pastors, we can't overemphasize how important it is that you get this deep in your heart and deep in your spirit. Your life is about stewardship. Stewardship is about management. Management is not about ownership. You don't own a thing. Boy, that sounds encouraging. Wow, pastor, you just really, You're like, I've worked so just hard. really building me up this morning. I've worked my whole life to get all I have, and you're here to tell me that I own nothing. It's about management. In the very beginning in Genesis 1 and 28, God said to Adam and Eve that they were to be fruitful and that they were to multiply and do what? Fill the earth and govern it. In the, in the, very, in the very launching of, of our human race, God established that we as human beings have a role that has been given to us by him to be managers, to be stewards of all that he has given us. And everything that he's given us doesn't belong to us. It belongs to him. Matthew, I'm sorry, Psalm 24 and verse 1 says the earth is whose? It's the Lord's. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all its people belong to him. God is owner of everything. So everything that we have, everything that's been given to us has been given to us by God. We have to understand this. Once you get this and you grasp it in your heart, I'm, I'm, I'm truly telling you that your life will totally begin to change. When you reverse the role and you realize that we are God's servants, that we are managers of what he's given us and he owns it all. Stewardship at its roots is really about one thing, trust. Think about it. Think about it. Managing all of God's resources, the time, talent, and treasure he's given us is all about trust. And the sooner we figure this out, the sooner we learn to unlock the blessings yeah. and the favor of God's provision and protection in our lives. How many of you want the blessings of God's favor and protection in your life and on your family? Amen. We're going to talk about that this morning. How many of you guys have ever had something valuable that you loaned to somebody else? Anybody? Maybe your car, maybe, maybe some jewelry. 
I remember when our kids each turned 16, and we have four of them, and as they turned 16, they would want to take our car and go somewhere. And I remember in those early years, those first few months, it was like, yeah, yeah, no, you're not taking our car. You can take the car that we got for you, right? Because that's your car. And if you run it off the road or you back into a pole or you do something crazy that kind of happens in those beginning months of learning to drive, then that's going to be your car, right? I needed to teach them responsibility. They weren't going to take our car, but once I knew that they were good drivers, I had no problem letting any one of them take our car. And that's why today we only let the three of them and not AJ uh, borrow our car. That's not true. <laughs> Just saying. And then now we have a bonus daughter. Any of them can take our car at any time. We don't mind at all. And when they're home from college or they're home from work, oftentimes they grab our car. You want to know why? Because it has a full tank of gas in it. So they're like, I'm going to use your car, right? They know that they're not the owner but they treat it like they are, or they know they will lose that gift and that privilege. Also, as they were growing up, there were so many times once they had that driver's license, and once I grieved initially that they were getting older, oftentimes I would ask them to stop at the store for me, because they were in town for school every day, so I'd be like, hey, run by Walmart, and here's you a list. And if I didn't have enough cash, I would just hand them off my debit card. Well, in the beginning, you know, I make sure that they understood. You understand this is not your card, it's my card. The money in that account doesn't belong to you, it belongs to me. So don't go blowing it on a bunch of junk we don't need. Here's your list. Then as the years progress, that became such a blessing to us that all the time we'll hand off a debit card to any one of our kids and they'll pick things up. But that didn't come without us learning to trust them. Now imagine if just one time they would have taken that card and bought a whole bunch of junk that I didn't know anything about. Do you think wait, that privilege wait, 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 would wait. still be there? Wait, that kind of happened the other day. Oh, it did not. It, it kind, well, You're going to tell on somebody. It, it, it kind of did. You're going to so stretch on, it. On okay, Friday, go ahead. So on Friday, uh, Mia comes into the office and she said, hey, Dad, um, she said, uh, you drove my Jeep while I was gone. And so I need some gas money. And I'm like, okay, you know, fair enough. She I came did. home from college fair and her enough. Jeep was on E. <clears throat> she leaves the Jeep here which is pretty cool. Uh, and so, I, yeah, I drove it a few times, just back and forth from my house to the church. Maybe, I may have driven it maybe five miles, all right? So I'm like, you know, five. I mean, okay, maybe 10. Grove is farther than five okay, miles, I went but to okay, Grove. go ahead. I went to Grove and back, but maybe 10, 15 miles. Anyway, I said, all right, that's not the point. The point is, I said, okay, honey. I said, you know, I'm gonna be fair with you. So I open up my wallet and I hand her 10 bucks. <laughs> and she laughed. <laughs> and she's a salesman because there was a silence. Like, she's going to close this deal. She's just going to stare at me. She knew what the price she, of gas was. She, she didn't want to do she that. Said, she laughed. So I'm like, okay. All right. I, I know what's next. So I hand her the debit card. Okay. So then I go back to work. And I'm th it, it occurs to me as she's on her way to the gas station, I probably ought to give her some sort of parameters as to because she might just fill it up. I only drove it to Grove. <laughs> so I texted her and I can read, I can show you the text. I texted her and said, all right, no more than $25. She texted me back, you're cute, hearts. <laughs> <laughs> and I haven't checked the account yet, but I'm pretty sure she told more me, than $25 left the account. She told me, account. she said, she said, I just thought it would be funny, so I put 30 in it because he said 25, but I know that dad likes to drive my Jeep around, so he can drive it some more this week on me. <laughs> but you know, the funny thing is, is that trust doesn't just happen, does it? You don't just trust someone without something very vital, and that something is called relationship. I don't walk up to a stranger on the street and hand them off my debit card because they're hungry right? No. I don't loan somebody the keys to my car that I have yet to have a relationship with or that I trust. Trust is something that is built through relationship. So today I want you to ponder on two questions that we're going to be diving in throughout this message. The first one is this, can God trust you? Don't answer this out loud because this is something that you really need to think about throughout this message. And you may say, well, how do I know if God can trust me? Well, throughout the message, you're going to figure that out. But ask yourself, can God 
trust you. That's actually the title of today's message. This is part two, be the church, build the church. And that is what we're gonna talk about is can God trust you? But the second question you need to ask yourself is, can you trust God? Can you trust God? These two tie together. Well, today, if you have your Bible, I want you to turn to 1 Kings. It's in the Old Testament, 1 Kings chapter 17. And before we start reading, I want to give you some context about this passage. So in this passage, we're looking at the nation of Israel, and they are embarking on a 42-month fast, not fast, sorry, they're going to fast, a 42-month drought. A drought is a time when there's no rain, okay? That's three and a half years. Now, I want you to notice that this is an agricultural community. So if there's no rain, there would also be no what? Help me out. There's no crops. That means there's no food. That means there's no money, okay? So rain was so very important during that day and time for their culture. So for 42 months, there's not gonna be any rain, all right? So you gotta understand that as we pick up in verse seven. Chapter 17, here we go. But after a while, the brook or the creek, it dried up for there was no rainfall anywhere in the land. Then the Lord said to Elijah, now who's Elijah? Elijah is the prophet of God. This is God's man for the hour. He's gonna go in and he's gonna speak on behalf of God to his people. Verse nine, go in and live in the village of Zarephath near the city of Sidon. I've instructed a widow there to feed you. Who has he instructed to feed him? A widow, you guys are good at this. Okay, verse 10. So he went to Zarephath and he arrived at the gates of the village and he saw the widow gathering sticks. Listen, this is really important. She was gathering sticks. She was doing what she could do. You gotta understand that in that culture, widows did not work, okay? That means her husband has passed away. She doesn't have a job. She wasn't allowed to, but she's doing what she could do. She's gathering up sticks. Obviously, she's preparing to fix a meal. And he asked her, would you please bring me a little water in a cup? And as she was going to get it, he calls out to her, bring me a bite of bread too. But, he, but she said, I swear by the Lord God that I don't have a single piece of bread in this house. I only have a handful of flour left in a jar and a little bit of cooking oil at the bottom of a jug. I was just gathering the sticks to cook the last meal and then my son and I will die. Now I want you to just pause for a moment and I want you to just think about this situation. God told Elijah to go to the widow, right? Did you see me read that? God is the one who sent Elijah to the widow. God knows it's going to not rain for 42 months. So God sends Elijah ahead to this widow. And he says, I'm gonna send you to the widow because I want to do a miracle for the widow. You gotta begin to understand what's about to happen in this picture, all right? So the widow says, hey, I'm doing everything that I know how to do. I'm gathering up sticks, but I'm about to go in and make the last biscuit. My son and I, we're gonna split it and then we're gonna die. She doesn't feel like there's any hope left whatsoever, but she doesn't realize what God has up, her, what God has up his sleeve. The first thing I want you to understand from this passage today is simply this. God knows your present situation. Think about it. God already knew she wasn't gonna make it through. He knew that there was only a handful of flour. He knew that there was only a couple tablespoons of oil left in that jug. He knew the fear that was gripping her heart. And that's exactly why he sends Elijah because God already knew. So right now you have to begin to ask yourself, what situation are you going through? What is it right now that's gripping your heart? What is it right now that you're wondering how you're gonna make it? Are you aware that God already knows your situation? That God's already working out the details of how he's gonna provide for you. He just hasn't let you in on it just yet. And notice how this is gonna roll out here in just a minute. It never lays out the way we think it will. So how do we know that the drought was 42 months long? Because we can look back in history and it's recorded. Did that drought have an end? And so will every season of your temptation, of your testing, of your attack? 42 is a very biblical number that represents temptation, represents demonic attack, but it also represents 
God's moment of arrival to make good on his promises. If we will learn to rest in him and to learn to trust him in the time of temptation, in the time of attack, if we will learn to trust him through it, we too will be able to look back and see an end to those. It's just, it's a season. It's temporary. It's not going to last forever, but it is a test. And God is testing you in your season of drought. You can replace drought with whatever you want. It might be your, your marriage is crumbling. It might be a financial situation. It might be an illness that you're battling and going through. It might just be God's testing your, your faith through something specifically, but it's a season. And God is saying, I want to see if through this season you are going to trust me. I want to know if you can trust me. And I want to know if I can trust you. You know, in the early days, as God was teaching us how to have faith in him, it was really hard, really, really, really hard to trust him until we got some, uh, some championships under our belt. And we were able then to look back and say, you know, God was really faithful. When we trusted him and we were just obedient and we rested in him and in his peace and we were, and we just did what we were supposed to do. He always showed up. He was always faithful. He never left us. He never forsook us. He never turned his back on us and forgot about us. He always showed up. He always showed off. He always provided when we did our part in faith. And so the next time, the next season came, guess what? It was a little easier to trust him the next time. And then the next time, after he had shown up the last time, we look back and we're like, you know what? It's a little easier this time to believe that God's going to, it's going to be okay. And here we are 16 years into this church plant. And now when storms hit, it's like the devil's like, <laughs> <laughs> scared, right? <laughs> and we're like, dude. God's faithful. Yeah, We're not going to react in fear. Yeah. We're not going to run around. We're not going to make it financially. Our marriage is going to fall apart. What are we going to do? We're going to have faith in God yeah. because he's faithful. He did it once. He did it again, 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 again. He's going to do it again yeah. because God is faithful and you can take him at his word. Yeah. But it's a faith test. Right. Right. And God's asking, can I trust you or not? Right. Can you trust me and can I trust you? That's the question yeah. God is asking. And that's the question God was asking this widow. Look at the first thing that Elijah said to her. The first thing before he taught her how to really have faith. He said, before I teach you this principle that I'm going to teach you, I need you to do one thing. What's he say in this verse 13? Verse 13. Don't be afraid. What's the first thing you do when all hell breaks loose in your season? Freak out. Freak out. Stop it. Yeah. That is not the reaction God wants you to have. Right. God is telling you, do not be afraid. Do you believe I'm with you or not? Yeah. Come on, amen. You just got a bad diagnosis. Do you believe I am with you or not? You're looking at the bank account. Do you believe he is with you or not? Amen. Whatever it is, fill in the blank. Yeah. Do you trust him and can he trust you? Do not be afraid. Amen. He said, go ahead and, and do just what you've said, but there's the contrasting conjunction. Make a little bread for me, what? First. Now that's odd. Didn't. Was he present when she just said there was only enough cake for a little biscuit for her and her son to split and then they were going to die? How does he now think that there's enough for him too? That doesn't make any sense at all. That's so backwards. And, and are you deaf? Like she just said, there's like one biscuit, dude. Like you want us to split it three ways? What are you asking me here? I don't understand. It's faith and faith. Guess what? It doesn't make sense. It never makes sense. Jesus takes dirt and spits in it, makes mud and shoves it in a dude's eye. That makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Oh, yeah, obviously, if I want to see, I need you to rub mud in my eyes. That makes perfect sense. Why didn't I think of this earlier, <laughs> right? It doesn't make any sense. 
in the natural, but that's not the kind of God we serve. We serve a supernatural God that does just the very opposite of what makes sense because guess what? He's God. He's God. It's why we, it's why we fast and pray. We do it once a month. In fact, we've got a, 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 a three days of fasting coming up this Wednesday, and I know what you do because I used to do it too. You look at that and you're like, that does not sound like fun to me. I don't think I'm called to that. I, I don't think that that's actually my ministry is to fast from food. So I'm just going to pray and skip the fasting. Why don't we want to fast? Because it's very uncomfortable and it's hard. But God says, he's the God of opposites. He says, if you want me to increase in your life, in everything, I need you to decrease. I need you to just make all of you, your wants and your desires and your, your, your temptations, all, all of it, I need it to go away so that I can show up and show off. He does just the opposite. This is a faith test. So he says, bring me this bite of cake first, then use what's left. So there's going to be some left now. Okay, this is weird math. All right. There's going to be more than a biscuit left. Then use what's left to prepare a meal for yourself and your son. Not a bite, not just a biscuit, but a meal for you and your son. For this is what the Lord says, the God of Israel. There will always be flour and olive oil left in your containers until the time when the Lord sends rain and the crops grow again. So she did as Elijah said, and she and Elijah and her family continued to eat for many days. There was always enough flour and olive oil left in the containers, just as the Lord had promised through Elijah. Now, how is that? How did that, how does that even make sense? We have to pause right here. This is called the principle of the first. This is experiencing God's provision and God's protection, God's favor and God's blessing when it doesn't make sense. The promise of always having enough flour and oil was conditional. Do you understand? It was conditional. What was the widow supposed to do? If she wanted her containers and, and to be blessed, if she wanted the oil and the, and the, and the uh, flour to be blessed, what was she supposed to do? Make the prophet a cake what? First. Before you do anything else. It's hard for us to wrap our mind around this. It's hard for us to understand why God would ask us to do such a thing. But listen, it wasn't about the cake or biscuit or whatever you've conjured up in your mind as to what this thing was they were making. It wasn't about that. It was what it was about was her. It was about her heart. It was a test to see if she could fully trust God. And the question for you today is, can you trust God? And can God trust you? You know, when you really begin to understand this story and you study it out, we believe that this is only six months into a 42 month drought. So we can see at the end of the story, it's very easy for us to see how it all played out and to see that, man, God was there and God was going to provide and God had went before her and sent Elijah. Man, how much God must have loved her. But you know, she didn't know any of that. She did not know when that test was laid before her, she didn't know how long the drought would last. She didn't know that God had truly sent Elijah, his man of God, to her to provide for her. But the fact is, that's what God did. God did not send Elijah to that widow because he wanted to take care of Elijah. God sent Elijah to that widow because he wanted to take care of the widow. And the way he was going to do it is by putting her to the test. You see, every single time you and I bring an increase into our homes, when we get a paycheck, we have that same test in front of ourselves every time. And it's the principle of the first. And that principle is found in Malachi chapter three and verse 10. And it simply says this, bring all, say all, bring all of the tithes into the storehouse so there will be enough food in my temple. If you do, here we go again, conditional, if you do, here's what I'm going to do, all right? God says, if you'll be obedient, here comes my promise. The Lord of heaven's army, I will open up the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great you won't even have enough room to take it in. Try me. Put me to the test. Here's what we miss so many times, guys, as believers. 
We can understand that Jesus gave us, like, Jesus laid down his life for you and I, and we can say, man, you can forgive me, and I can be reconciled to you, God, and I can have a relationship with you. And we say, I surrender all, and we sing it. We used to sing it. We could go back and sing it again. We sing, I surrender all, and we convince ourselves in our mind, I've surrendered everything to you. But God says, true surrender is when you're willing to put me first in every area of your life. And when you do what you're doing is you're inviting God into that area of your life. You're inviting God's provision into your finances. You're inviting God's protection into your family. When you in your marriage put God first in everything, you're inviting God into your marriage. And can I just tell you, if you are not doing that, you're not gonna make it in this world today in your marriage if you're not putting God first. There should have been like a thousand amens in this room. Is anybody happily married in here? Okay, at least 10 of you raise your hand. Good, okay. Did you see me? I was like. <laughs> can I can see am. you. <laughs> but it's the same with every part of our life. When you put God first in your parenting, you're inviting God into your parenting. When you put God first in your relationships, you're, you're inviting him into every one of those relationships. And when you put him first in your finances, you're saying, God, I trust you. By you taking that top 10%, and guys, listen, you notice that God did not wait until after she had baked that little, that little biscuit for herself first, and then he said, hey, you know what? Whatever's left, make one for Elijah. He didn't do that because that would not have been a test. And that's why the test is when I get paid, before I pay my electric bill and my mortgage and put the gas on the car, and put the clothes on the backs of the kids and go get the groceries first before anything else, I say, God, I return to you what is yours. Because Psalms 24 says it's all God's. Everything that I have is given to me by God. And guys, when you begin to wrap your mind around this, I know it's hard to sometimes begin to understand, but I am telling you, when you do, God blesses that 90%. God begins to bring supernatural blessings into your life. We could spend the rest of the day telling you story after story after story of how God provided for a family that came to Oklahoma to plant a church when we had nothing. When our advisor said, you know, I think you guys really should think about a bigger city. I think you guys really should consider going under a church planning organization. I think maybe you should go get yourself a mother church. Don't step out there as Green Berets with no money in the middle of the field across from a bump of buffalo. And we said, it makes no sense. But we believe that's what God said to do. 16 years later, I think God was right. Do you agree? And because of that, there were so many times, guys, so many times that we reminded God what he asked us to do and what we did. There were so many times when planting, and there was very, very little money, and there wasn't groceries in the house. There wasn't diapers for the babies. There were so many times that we got on our knees and we said, God, we have put you first. God, we're going to stand on your word. God, you said if we would put you first, God, you would open up the windows of heaven and you would pour out a blessing upon us so great we would not be able to contain it. God, we put you to that test. And I cannot tell you how many times we walked out when we had bills to pay and checked the mailbox to find just the right amount of money in cash straight from heaven to pay a bill. Walk out of a service over to our car to find cash on the top of the car. Why? Not to say that we weren't, listen, I'm not saying that God is the candy man and he throws money and dollar bills at you, but when you make him your priority, listen to me, and you are doing your best with the 90, and there's just not enough, just like in this, there just wasn't enough. God supernaturally wants to move. Do you know why? Because it brings glory to him. Do you know how many people drive past this church and their heads spin around? Because every time they drive by, something else looks different. Why? Is that because of us? No. It's all because of him. Because when you begin to put him first, you begin to glorify him in your life. And it's all a test.
You know, Jesus didn't ask us to do something that he wasn't willing to do himself. So you think about how did, how did Jesus become the example in returning the tithe to God? Do we have any accounts where he gave financially a tenth of his income? Here's how he became the tithe himself. In the feast of first fruits, this is, you know, we, we talk a lot about the feasts of the Lord uh, throughout the year in this church. In fact, we talked about the feast of first fruits in the last series that we did. In Israel, God commanded on the day of the, the feast of first fruits that the people would, they were celebrating the barley harvest. And God said, I'm going to bless the entire harvest, but you need to give me the first and best from that crop. And if you give me back the first and best and you present it to me as an offering, then I'm going to bless the entire harvest, okay? On the exact day of the Feast of First Fruits, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, they had been celebrating this. On that exact same day, Jesus was in the tomb and he was resurrected from the grave. And as he resurrected from the grave, he became the first fruit offering for all of humanity. He became the sacrifice. He became the offering. And he's the only one that could have been the offering because he was the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He was perfect and blameless and spotless. He's the only one. That's why it's only through Jesus we can be saved. But when Christ was resurrected, he became the first fruit offering. And God said, because because I accept you, then I will bless the rest. As you look around this room, all of us who are sealed in Christ, all of you that are joining us online today, if you have said yes to Jesus, if you have sealed your eternity in him and by his name, then you are part of the harvest that God is reaping and saying, I'm going to bring you unto myself. I'm going to make a home for you in heaven and I'm going to call you my own. Aren't you thankful for who Jesus is? Aren't you thankful? thankful that he became that first fruit offering. And so he was showing us by example that this is a principle that God wants us to follow. He gave everything. God's not asking us to lay down our lives like Jesus did. All he's asking is, can you please just trust me because I want to bless you. I want to have a relationship with you and, there's, and you can't have a relationship with someone that you don't trust. It's not about the money. It's about you. Do you understand? It's about something that God wants to do in our hearts as his people. He wants us to be blessed. He wants us to walk in his favor, his provision, his protection, because we are his church and we're here only for a time, only for a short time to reach as many people as we possibly can with the time, talent, and treasure that he has given us because one day we will stand before God and, and it is our job to take as many people with us to heaven as we possibly can. The life that we're living here is not to be lived for ourselves. It's not to pat ourselves on the back and say, look at all this time talent that I have. Look at all this time. Look at all this money, all this treasure. It's not about you. God has given it to you for you to multiply it, to be a blessing, to build his church, to build his kingdom, help rescue people from hell and make heaven their home. Let's pray today. Amen. Father, we thank you today, Jesus, that you were willing to not just give a tenth, but you gave your all when you gave your son. God, I pray today that you would help our minds to be able to receive today the word that has been spoken. Maybe you're here today and you say, you know, I, I've struggled with this whole tithing thing. I've struggled with this throughout my life. I want to just challenge you to begin to ask God to open your eyes. To begin to ask God to just illuminate it in your mind and help you to understand the word of God clearly. There's more than 2,400 passages of scripture on this very thing, this principle of the first and stewardship. And it's not about our money, but it's about do we trust God and can he trust us? Today, I just wanna pray for you that if you're not quite there yet, that you would begin to just take this challenge and just put God to the test 
and just begin to watch what he'll do in your life. God, I just pray right now, Lord, over each and every person in this room and all of those who are watching online today. God, I pray right now that you would give us the courage, God, to just put you to the test. God, we just take the challenge. God, I pray that we would be servants, God, that could one day stand before you and hear you say, well done, my good and faithful servant. You have served me well. You have been faithful in the little things and God's gonna make you ruler over much. God, I pray right now that you would help us, Father God, in those moments of weakness when we're being put to the test. God, that we don't react and be freaking out, but God, that we place our trust wholeheartedly in you, God, with the principle of the first, God, and we stand back and we watch you provide and protect, Lord, our families. Jesus, we thank you. With heads bowed and eyes closed, God wants to have relationship with you. But he wants to know if you can trust him. Have you trusted Christ to redeem you, to save you, to forgive you, to make you his own? Have you trusted that only through him you can be saved? Do you have a real and life-changing relationship with him that's contagious? You know, heaven is calling this isn't our home. Heaven is our home. And you need to secure your place in heaven for eternity. And you can do that by asking God to forgive you of your sins. Believe that Jesus is the son of God and confess him to be Lord of your life. We want to encourage you to do that today. If you are watching online, comment all in in the comment section below. If you're in this room right now, would you just raise your hand and we're going to pray this prayer together as a church family in this place. If that's you, amen. Amen. Thank you, Father God. Thank you. I see your hand. Thank you. I see your hand up in the bleachers. Yes, Lord. Anybody else? Thank you. I see your hand up in the middle. I see your hand up front in the middle. Yes, 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 yes. I see your hand on my left up front. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. I see your hand in the middle. Yes. Thank you, Father God. I see your hand on my right. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Father God. Thank you for all of these that are saying yes to Jesus. I see both of your hands up in the bleachers. Yes. Father, we are so grateful. Let's pray this prayer together as a church family. Father, forgive me of my sins. I believe with all my heart, Jesus is the Son of God. I confess him today to be Lord of my life. Help me, God, to put you first. Help me to trust you in everything. I want to be blessed. I want to be used by you to be your church and build your church. In Jesus' name.